I'm a psychologist, and I'm going to talk about politics, about the psychology of politics. Anyone who lives in Israel must have participated in many arguments between hawks and doves. And it's an interesting phenomenon that hawks tend to win most of these arguments. And so for many years, I have been wondering, actually, why do doves sound timid, naive, childish? Why do hawks sound like realistic adults, people who really understand the world and find their way in it? And I now believe that modern psychology actually provides an answer to the advantage of hawks over doves in arguments, not only in Israel, but everywhere. I personally encountered this problem many years ago. The year was 1973, and it was spring or early summer, a few months before the Yom Kippur War. There was a conference at the Van Leer Institute, not too far from here. And the topic of the conference was social science and strategy or social science and war. And of course, the underlying theme of that conference was a debate between hawks and doves. And at the time, in 1973 in Israel, the argument between hawks and doves was about the advantages and disadvantages of a settlement with Egypt that would include withdrawal from Sinai including withdrawal from strategic air bases that were con considered extremely important. Now, the hawks and the doves in this argument in 1973 agreed on the crucial objective, and the agreement was obvious. They, all of them, wanted to keep to a minimum the probability of a military disaster. But they had different views about how that could be accomplished. Now, what I pointed out in my talk at the Van Leer Institute was that the probability of a military disaster to Israel actually involves two elements. One is the probability that there will be a war, and the second, the probability that there will be disaster if there is a war. Now, the doves in these arguments always focused on the first of these probabilities. They had the idea that withdrawal from the Sinai, or agreeing to withdraw, being willing to withdraw, would reduce the probability of war. And the hawks had a completely different view. And they stressed the fact that if there was a war, then it would certainly be a very good idea to keep the Sinai as a buffer and that the Sinai had considerable value. And there was no real way to compute the probability. What is the probability that there will be a war and what the probability of a disaster in a war if you do agree to withdraw or if you don't agree to withdraw? And the history of what happened later really does not provide a con conclusive answer. We know that 3,000 soldiers lost their life, but that doesn't tell us whether the doves or the hawks were right at that time. What we is of interest is that clearly both the doves and the hawks had a point. They were both making a serious claim. But somehow, the argument that the doves were making seemed weaker. It seemed less compelling than the argument that the hawks were making. Because the core of the idea was that concessions would reduce the probability of war. And this argument could be contested, and indeed it was contested. The hawks would claim in those conversations that withdrawal would not only not reduce the probability of war, it would actually increase the probability of war, because the other side only understand the language of force and such arguments. In contrast, the doves could not contest the argument of the hawks. It was certainly true that in case of a war, keeping, holding on to the Sinai would be a very large advantage. Now, arguments of this kind happen a lot. Not only here, they happen everywhere. There are doves and hawks in many places. And in all 
those arguments about whether to make a major concession in the hope of achieving an agreement, the doves have an argument that is probabilistic. It is not a sure thing. The hawks appear to argue for a sure thing, that keeping something will give you a strategic advantage. But the point that I was making in 1973, and I think it's a valid point, is that this impression of certainty is a mistake. In fact, many years later, Amos Tversky and I, in our research on decision-making under uncertainty, we, we gave a name to that mistake. We called it pseudo-certainty. It's actually the illusion of certainty. There is no certainty because whether or not there will be a war is a probabilistic event. And just assuming that there is a war and calculating the consequences then is not really sufficient for a compelling argument. Now, there was another reason for the advantage of Hawks in this case and actually in many other cases. And this is an asymmetry in responsibility and blame that Hawks and Doves, when they are in a position of leadership, take upon themselves. And there is an interesting fact about what happened in Israel after the 1973 war. There was, of course, a massive amount of reckoning, cheshbon nefesh, about what had happened. And there was an enormous amount of anger about the lack of preparedness. And that was the focus of attention for a long time. What was in some ways remarkable was that so far as I could see then, no one blamed the government for not responding to the peace of overtures of the Egyptians that maybe could have prevented that war. That argument barely came up. Even after the fact, it was assumed that the war had taken place, and then the question was whether Israel was properly prepared for it. You can just try to imagine what would have happened if Israel had in fact agreed to a settlement, and then Egypt had broken the agreement, there had been a war, 3,000 Israeli soldiers would have been killed, and we would have end up, ended up where, in fact, we did end up. It's absolutely clear when you think about that, that national leaders who would have made such an agreement and reached such a consequence, they would appear to be idiots. They would appear to be fools, naive fools. When leaders have to decide on such matters, they not only consider the probability of a military disaster, and perhaps the probability of a military disaster is not even the thing that looms largest in their mind. They also consider the probability that it will be seen in history, in retrospect, in hindsight, as having been stupid and naive. Trusting the asymmetry gives a very powerful advantage to hawks because trusting your adversary exposes you to the risk of being judged stupid. Mistrust doesn't involve this risk. Mistrust is actually safer from the point of view of the leaders. Now, I don't want to claim that trust is always justified. Of course it is not. Of course betrayal is common. Nor do I want to claim that doves are always right. Of course they are not. Doves are, in fact, wrong quite often. My point is simply that there is a bias. Hawks win arguments that they do not deserve to win because we are biased in their favor, because rhetorically, in these arguments, it is just easier to argue the hawkish line than the dovish line. They appear sensible, even when, in fact, they are not rational. Now, the psychological analysis doesn't end here. And the last 40 years have yielded many discoveries of cognitive and emotional biases. That's been my career, but it's also been the career of many other psychologists. And many biases have been discovered that have nothing to do ostensibly with conflict. They have been studied in many other situations. But a few years ago, when I was again due to give a, a lecture in Van Leer, in the Van Leer Institute, I drew up a list of all the biases that psychologists had discovered during the last 30 or 40 years, and the results were truly surprising to me. Because it turned out that essentially all the cognitive biases that have been discovered 
favor the hawks in these arguments. They tend to make the hawks more believable. They tend to make the hawks more convincing than, in fact, they deserve to be. The list of biases is actually quite long, I think 10 or 12. And of course, I have five minutes left, so I only have time to mention a few examples. I'll mention one bias that actually has not been studied in situations of conflict, but in, it's one of the major discoveries of social psychologists. And they've given it a grandiose name, the fundamental attribution error. And the basic idea of this bias is that there is a difference between the way that we explain our own behavior and the way that we explain the behavior of other people. And the rule, the finding, is very simple. We think of ourselves as responding to situations. We explain our behavior by saying, well, this was the situation, and I was responding to the situation. We explain the behavior of other people very differently. We're explaining by assuming that they have traits, that they have dispositions that are permanent and that will not go away. Now, to give you an example of that, a personal example, some years ago I had several encounters with a person and I formed the impression that he is a very sad and silent person. And then I had the occasion of seeing the same person interacting with other people and he was actually the life of the party. And then I understood something that had never occurred to me before, that I was causing him to be sad and silent. He was responding to me. It was not his characteristic. It was what I was doing, and I had interpreted what he was doing as a permanent trait. This rule, the fundamental attribution error, applies with special force to conflicts. It's true in marital quarrels, and it's true in international conflict, that in general, <clears throat> I see myself as reacting to the provocation of others, but I find, it difficult to <clears throat> I find it difficult to see that the other side, my wife, say, is reacting to my provocations. In the period leading to the Yom Kippur War, the Hawks believed, and that's an example, that the desire of Egyptians for war expressed a permanent hostility and a permanent desire to wipe out Israel, that it was not a reaction to the insult of the occupation. This assumption that the other side's hostility is immutable is a common part of the hawkish worldview. And it's accompanied often by a belief that the only language that the other side understands is forced. And this belief is simply an expression of intellectual laziness. This is simply not true. There are very few people who only understand that language. In general, then, the fundamental attribution error supports the belief that conciliatory moves are a waste of time. But in fact, conciliation sometimes works. I'm sure that most Israelis feel that trading the Sinai for 35 years of calm was a good business. Even if the peace was never perfect, and even if the peace does not last forever, we bought some time. Here again, I don't want to claim that conciliation always works, only that there is a powerful bias against it. And the bias comes from the way our mind is built, not necessarily from bad intentions on any side. I will give another example that I find very painful, another manifestation of the fundamental attribution error. And this is in conversation between Israelis and Europeans. And Israelis are very sensitive to the antagonism of Europeans. And the standard line that Israelis really do believe in is that European antagonism to Israel is driven by anti-Semitism. I don't want to argue that there is no anti-Semitism in Europe. Of course there is. But the question is really whether the first thought that comes to mind when European centrist or leftist thinks of, think of Israel is that it's a Jewish state. I don't think so. I think that what comes to mind first is that Israel occupies territory, and occupation happens to be a very dirty word in Europe. It is not a dirty word in the United States, but it is a dirty word in Europe. Now notice what the effect is of labeling all criticism as anti-Semitism. The effect and that is very common, 
Anti-Semitism is a permanent thing. It will never go away. It is not a reaction to what we do. It is a reaction to what we are. And if it isn't anti-Semitism, there is absolutely no reason to change what we do. If it is a reaction to what we do, then perhaps there is reason to examine what we do. There is more. There are many other biases that lead to uh, that lead to the advantage that hawks have over doves. And I should repeat, my claim in this talk, which was not an easy talk to think of, and it was not an easy talk to deliver here, I didn't say, and I don't want to say, that doves are always right. I did say that hawks win more arguments than they should. And my recipe for a better world tomorrow is a world in which people acknowledge the psychological reality of the biases cognitive and emotional that favor hawks, admit that in some conditions the hawkish bias can lead to disaster, and I hope that in the better world of tomorrow, people make an effort to avoid this bias. Thank you.